History happened everywhere. A random place, a random time, and a topic pulled from the hat. The challenge? Find the fascinating, uncover the unexpected, and share the stories. You're listening to... History happened everywhere. Hello, my name is Ryan Weir, and I'm here in the HHE studio with the flotsam to my jetsam. It's Mr. Peter Goddard. I'm flotsam, am I? Yeah. Do you know the difference between flotsam and jetsam? One is deliberately thrown over, and one is, like, washed over. Or... I believe so, yeah. I don't know which one is which, though. I think jetsam you've jettisoned over the side yourself, uh-huh. and flotsam has flopped over. <laughs> So, Peter, last week, the Dursalator gave us red in the Atlantic during World War II. So, how's that been for you? It's been an adventure. I have to say, one of the distinguishing colours of the Atlantic is not red. It's mostly blues and greens, I've found. But uh, yeah. I've struggled around. I've found some fascinating stories. OK. In fact, we're going to take a tot of grog and set out to experience the Battle of the Atlantic, the longest battle of World War II. We will slip beneath the waves with a deadly U-boat that caused controversy when it took one of the first maritime casualties of the war. We'll find out why an enemy was not always the bad guy, and we'll climb a stairway to discover a very special Canadian bar. Please put on your life jacket, Ryan, and prepare to board the lifeboats. We're going to the Atlantic. Okay, well, look, I am interested to see in which waves oh good god (laughs) you've interpreted this so uh why don't you start by surfing us up (laughs) oh my lord (laughs) some orientation perhaps you know where exactly is the atlantic peak the atlantic ocean it is in fact the second largest of the world's five oceans can you name the world's five oceans sure off you go (laughs) billy (laughs) (laughs) Uh, atlantic correct pacific correct Indian. Yes. And I'm out. Southern and the Arctic are the other ones. Arctic I might have got at a push. So the Atlantic is the second biggest, the Pacific is the largest. And where is it? Well, if you start on the west coast of Africa or Europe and go west, as soon as you're wet, you're in the Atlantic Ocean. Oh, okay. So then you stay wet until you stop being wet by hitting either South America or North America, and you will have crossed the Atlantic Ocean. So it's the big ocean that separates the vertical kind of landmass of Europe and Africa from the vertical landmass of North and South America. How many Frances is in the Atlantic? Well, I'm glad you asked that. There are about 100 Frances in an Atlantic Ocean. No way. I thought it'd be way more than that. No, France is pretty big. 100 it is a lot. It is a lot. That's true. It's, uh, I think it's 20% of the Earth's surface. That's amazing. It's split, interestingly, into the North and South Atlantic. That's not the interesting part. The interesting <laughs> part is the split is not at the equator, but it's about eight degrees north where the, the two Atlantics split. And it's defined by the equatorial countercurrent. Oh, the old equatorial countercurrent. Yeah. Do you know what? It's a really good question because I've heard of the North and South Atlantic before. Never considered why it was one of the two. I would have just assumed it was the equator. Well, let me give you a fact that you particularly particularly are going to love. The Coriolis effect circulates yep. North Atlantic water in a clockwise direction. Yeah. And South Atlantic water circulates counterclockwise. And these are known as gyres, these big circular movements of water in the ocean. Or plastic capture traps, as we know them. <laughs> well, yes, there is that. Uh, but the Atlantic is unsurprisingly big, but it's a little bit difficult to say exactly where it begins and ends. But broadly speaking, it's about 41 million square miles or 106 million square kilometres. I mean, that's the problem with sea, though, isn't it? There's no real distinguishing features on it to be able to go, here's a borderline or anything. Yeah, it's epically difficult to actually draw a line on as well. <laughs> yeah. As for the population of the Atlantic, it's an ocean, so not yeah. a lot of people, but potentially it's not zero either. There's a person called Lee Watchstetter, who was a retiree who wrote the story about how she spent 12 years living on a cruise ship called the Crystal Serenity. Ah. Her book was entitled, I May Be Homeless, But You Should See My Yacht. (laughs) Uh, that's a good retirement strategy as long as you've got about $170,000 a year to spend on it now the capital city of the Atlantic Ocean there is no capital city obviously but there are 54 different capital cities that actually sit on the Atlantic from Lisbon in Portugal Washington in the USA Accra in Ghana Havana Cuba and many many more another 50 in fact 
So all of those touch the Atlantic. Yeah. Oh, nice. That's a good way of doing that. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking, like, well, I was going to say the capital of the Atlantic is A. I would have gone with Atlantis. <laughs> I did think say. about yeah. that. <laughs> I really did think about that, especially for you. Yeah. Hey, Pete. Hey, Ryan. You know, sometimes we call the Atlantic the pond, as in America is across the pond. Yeah. Well, why do we do that? Well, I think it's just an example of good old British understatement, Ryan. It's like when Captain Oates went off to die in the snow and he said to his colleagues, I may be gone some time. Oh, right. British understatement. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that. Well, that's probably because you're not necessarily the brightest bulb in the box. Wait, is that British understatement? Uh, maybe a smidge. Wait, is that British understatement? Well, just a tad. Oh, look, I don't like this. I don't like it at all. Well, perhaps this will help. Ryan, you're an idiot. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's better. Thanks, Pete. So let's ask the question that's the elephant in the room, if you will. What is an ocean? Okay. <laughs> I never thought about it before. Well, there are oceans and there are seas. And what makes the difference? Are so they, Are they not the same thing? At its, well, sort of, yes. At its simplest, an uh, ocean is a very big bit of water. <laughs> Science in action. Uh, <laughs> geologically, it's an area of oceanic crust covered by water. And then I looked up oceanic crust. And that's the uppermost layer of the oceanic portion of the tectonic plates, which felt a bit circular, that the ocean is the bit on top of the oceanic crust, and the right. oceanic crust is the bit under the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> but but then the next question is, so an ocean is bigger than sea, I think we can agree. But when you look at a globe, what do you see? You see 71% of the Earth's surface, which is covered by water. Mm. But it's all interconnected. There isn't a separation between these things. So right. you could argue there is only one ocean and it is the Earth's ocean. Having a distinction between which part of the Earth's ocean you're on Precisely. would be very helpful. Where are you? The ocean doesn't, <laughs> doesn't really help much, does it? <laughs> yeah. So from the point of view of an ocean, you know when you've reached an edge when you hit land, obviously. Yep. But where water hits water, how do you define that? With this, oh, I've reached the end of the Atlantic Ocean. It's all a little bit arbitrary. It's often a physical characteristic and it's often a current, though. But for map purposes, currents tend to move. So even that, then you've got a mobile border. So often they will just select a parallel on the Earth and say, right, from eight degrees south, this is the Atlantic. And when you go down from there, it's the Southern Ocean. Can't you just stick a bunch of buoys in? You could, yes. I suppose if you had the will, you could set up a sort of set of boundaries. Yeah. That would be quite annoying for, I suspect there probably are a, a number of them in various areas. Yeah. But generally, ocean going is a fairly neutral affair. Most of the aggravation when it comes to territorial waters tends to be much nearer the coast. <laughs> Now, it is traditional on this podcast to sample the food and drink of a place. And there isn't really a food of the Atlantic. I thought about bringing you just a damp cod. But <laughs> I chose against a it. halibut. But I do have a candidate for a drink. Yeah, I did hear grog at the very beginning of this. <laughs> now, rum is a drink traditionally associated with sailors and the Navy, in particular British Navy. And part of that is because for over 100 years, it was a British sailor's right to get a ration of rum every day. <laughs> okay. So the officers would get a neat ration. Yeah. And the junior sailors would get it watered down and that watered down rum was known as grog oh okay so you may have heard grog described that's nothing more than watered down rum sometimes they would give you lime juice as well to help with your scurvy mm. uh, maybe sugar to, to make it a bit sweeter but that's what grog is it's just watered down rum so the daily tot of rum was a sailor's right in the british navy for well over 100 years until 31st of july 1970 the british navy thought well this is getting quite technological and i think everyone being a bit pissed at working on these computers and uh, rockets and whatnot is probably not a good idea uh, and they ceased the ration of the rum and that is known and mourned by naval folk to this day as black tot day you'll be delighted to know the queen or rather the king and an admiral can on a state occasion say splice the main brace and issue a tot of rum so it's not completely dead as a tradition even to this day to this day so they carry rum on board do they for that very purpose no i think they probably have to bring uh, well i think they have hospitality on naval ships anyway oh, i suppose uh, so, so yeah. i'm sure they have some lying around for various occasions it's just not part of your pay anymore but i brought us some navy rum to celebrate this affair it's by no coincidence though that rum is your favorite drink by either an astonishing coincidence <laughs> rum is my favorite drink and i went out and sampled a few to make sure i got the right one well i'm i'm, I'm very pleased so here we have it 
Pusser's Run? Uh, I pronounce it Pusser's, but it, I believe it's derived from the purser in a ship who was the person who would distribute the rum. Okay, so I'm reading the label here. It says that Pusser's is the original Navy rum, still produced in accordance with Admiralty regulations for rum. The superb rum in this bottle is the same rum that was issued in the Royal Navy. They called it Nelson's Blood. We call it Liquid History. There you have it. All right, I'm going to let you do the honours. have it a lovely golden color cheers my friend to the atlantic yar Yar. oh yeah it's definitely weaker (laughs) 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 yeah it's it's weaker Ah. (laughs) keep that stowed (laughs) stowed away batten (laughs) hatches etc stow away (laughs) what shall we do with a drunken sailor what shall we do with a drunken sailor what shall we do with a drunken sailor a lie in the morning hooray and up she rises well actually guys I've only had one pint I'd hardly say I was drunken I mean you guys said let's have a beer we had a beer that was it Put him in the long boat till the morning Shave his belly with a rusty razor Dunk him in the sea until he's sober Alive in the morning Hooray Well, that's a, that's a little bit strong, isn't it? I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm really okay I'm, I wouldn't have said I was drunk at all and is, is any of this really necessary? Change his Facebook status to it's complicated Hack his Twitter to say something racist Post and share a picture of him fully naked A lie in the morning Well, you've really crossed the line now, fellas I mean, that's just mean, that's cruel That's totally overboard We all went out, we all had the same amount of drink You guys are getting out of control Kick him in the nuts and twist his nipples Cut up with his hands and burn his face off Chuck him in the sea and call the sharks in A lie in the morning There is something wrong with you people. Okay, I call this next section red. (laughs) So red is a colour. We've discussed colours before. We discussed the colour blue before. We did. We noted at that time that some languages don't have a word for the colour blue. Well, red is kind of the opposite of that because a study of languages has suggested that as languages develop, the first thing they develop in terms of words is a distinction from light and dark or black and white. And almost always the next color that gets a word is red right why i don't know but i mean it's an important color you've you've got blood you can see yeah. berries poisonous things are danger often red danger you know, these are all things you need to know about in the world so i guess it's not surprising that you have a word for that before you have a word for anything else also interestingly it's also the first color that was used by early man artists oh, okay ochre uh, exactly red ochre and iron oxide would be available so cave paintings and things often have a red color because they're uh, available material for that uh, for that painting. Uh, but also, if you find yourself on the Atlantic Ocean and you see a ship flying a red flag at the stern with a Union Jack in the canton or the top left corner, that is what's known as a red ensign. So a red ensign is also known as a red duster sometimes. Uh, it actually has a white stripe on the hoist side, but you can't really see it because flagpole is normally white. A red ensign, by the way, is the ones who usually die in Star Trek first. <laughs> yes, it very much is, isn't it? Mm. But if you see a red ensign with a Union Jack on it, that means it's a British ship. So it's registered in Britain, basically. As a side note, I discovered I got down a bit of a rabbit hole in terms of how ships do their things Mm. flags are worn by a ship but flown by the owner so the captain will fly a red ensign but the ship wears a red ensign yeah that makes sense hello my name is maria morales from flagfashion.com if you're a ship with especially big guns you can really bring them out this season by wearing the white ensign this beautiful and distinctive color will make a huge statement this fall. If you have a job that requires carrying a little extra cargo, the red ensign is the perfect addition. It's a really flattering shade and can always be accessorized with small escorting warships. Fascism is back in a huge way, but it's going to be more sophisticated this year. So if you're a U-boat out on the town, Teeming bold and striking colors like black, white, and red with Buddhist-inspired swastikas is a must. My name is Maria Morales from flagfashion.com. Now, 
Now, a red ensign doesn't just tell you it's British, but it also tells you it's a civilian ship. It's usually a merchant vessel or could be a pleasure craft. Because originally it was a Royal Navy flag, so the red ensign was flown by the Royal Navy. They had red, white and blue flags. But that changed over time. Nelson used a white ensign at Trafalgar in 1805. And in 1864, there was an admiralty order that said the Royal Navy would stop using the red and the blue. And the white ensign, which is a white flag with the red cross and, again, the Union Jack in the canton, became the only official Royal Navy ensign. So just save costs on flag making exactly i mean big flag lost out on that day (laughs) (laughs) so the red ensign was adopted as the civic shipping flag so you see a red ensign it means it's not a military ship slightly confusingly there is also a blue ensign which has all sorts of peculiar rules on but mostly it indicates the royal navy reserve so not the full navy but the reserve navy okay but it can also you can also fly it on your ship if you happen to be a royal navy reservist or there's a lot of reservists on your boat so if you see a blue one could be anything frankly okay (laughs) someone someone (laughs) somewhere is involved in the royal navy reserve that's about all i could really tell you (laughs) so the red ensign is merchant shipping we're going to be talking a lot about merchant shipping in the battle of the atlantic because this was a war in essence of submarines trying to sink merchant ships so just bear in mind in the stories that we tell every single merchant ship we talk about would be flying or would be wearing a red ensign caught yourself out there didn't i did yeah Okay, we are going to talk about World War II and specifically the Battle of the Atlantic. Now, I'm not going to explain what World War II was because I'm hoping that everyone's familiar with it. If not, please write in and complain. I will send you an email. A major part of World War II was known as the Battle of the Atlantic. This was the longest battle of World War II and it ran basically for the entirety of the war. How it gets narrowed into a single battle is because it's kind of an ong- It's like the Battle of Britain where it wasn't just continuous fighting, but it was an ongoing conflict in that area. The Atlantic's pretty key though, isn't it, to World War II? Given, yes, it, given that it, it's the thing that sort of connects the world well precisely for europe that's exactly the point so in the war all countries were reliant on some extent on imported goods but britain in particular imported 70 percent of its food well, it's an island right yeah exactly so britain was fighting in the war at the beginning the united states wasn't in the war but it was friendly to the uk so the united states a resource rich country would send help basically so the lifeline a lot of the goods came from north america usa canada across the atlantic to the UK to keep us alive basically to keep Mm. us alive and in the war and consequently that was a very tempting target and if they could cut that off the Germans would be delighted so they decided they would sink as many merchant vessels as they possibly could in order to basically it's like a very large scale siege just cut off the island run out of food and other resources and you win the war that way and what can you do about that exactly so the Germans decided this was a brilliant idea and the major tool for doing this blockading was the U-boat U-boat is a submarine basically German for submarine (laughs) Uh, and the man in charge of U-boats for Nazi Germany was a guy called Admiral Donitz Donuts Admiral Donuts if you wish Mmm Donuts Uh, Admiral Dennis was a really big believer in U-boats. He thought he could do major damage and possibly even turn the tide of the war if he had at least 300 U-boats. That's 100 out in the sea, 100 kind of going back and forth, and 100 in maintenance. And just to be clear, a U-boat wasn't small, right? No, no, they were pretty sizable. 300 of them? Well, that's how many he wanted. Ah, how many did he get? 57. (laughs) <laughs> that's less so whilst the u-boat threat was terrifying and we're going to learn some pretty scary things mm. he never really at the beginning had anything like what he wanted to achieve what he was trying to achieve so when you hear about the u-boat threat it was probably more limited than it's given credit for when we talk about these things uh, but anyway he pursued his plan to destroy shipping and keep britain and france isolated and originally at the beginning you just sent your boats out and said just go kill what you can pretty much that meant attacking shipping but at the very beginning of the war they agreed to abide by what are known as prize rules or cruiser rules for attacking merchant shipping. So the idea being that if you are a warship and you see another warship, you could start a fight because you're both in the war. Yeah. But obviously it's a bit more complicated because civilians are not supposed to be treated in that same way. So what the prize rules basically said was as a U-boat, you see a boat and you surface and you say, hello, good bad news for you. Uh, We're going to be coming on board now. You can then board the boat, see if they've got any contraband or any military goods, and then you could seize them if you like. They're allowed to be taken. If 
if it's not contraband or military goods, I guess you weren't allowed to take it. So what you would then have to do is take the crew to a place of safety hmm. and then you're allowed to sink the ship. Ah, OK. So as long as the people weren't killed. That was the idea. So this was a way of sort of the rules of war maintaining a certain amount of civility. Uh, and they agreed to do that at the start of World War Two. But actually, looking back a bit, at the end of World War One, Britain had developed an anti-U-boat strategy called Q-ships. And these were merchant vessels, but they had a load of guns on them, basically. So the idea was they'd kind of lure a submarine in. Submarine would rise to the surface and go, hello, guten tag, we're going to board you. And then, bush, you'd uncover the guns and blow it out. Ah. Now, this was not really the spirit of the rules, and the Germans were pretty unhappy about this breach of etiquette. Understandably. So there's a little bit of history about these prize rules. But still, at the start of the war, U-boats were going out under instruction to observe prize rules. So our first episode, I call Red Letter Days. They have been three weeks at sea, and no sign of the enemy convoy. Sometimes I wonder if we will ever encounter another. God for damn it, Hans! Stop making that noise! I cannot concentrate! Verzeihung, mein Kapitan! <sighs> Sometimes I wonder if we will ever encounter another soul in the vastness of the ocean. God damn it, that's it! I will be telling the viewer! Boom! <laughs> So our first story begins the Halifax Herald, Halifax in Nova Scotia, not Halifax in the Northern England. Uh, This is a newspaper that on the 4th of September 1939 hit the newsstands with a banner across the front page, Empire at War, in big red letters. There was another headline, it said, Liner Athenia is torpedoed and sunk. So what had happened was, three days earlier, 1st of September 1939, the Athenia was a passenger ship commanded by Captain James Cook, interestingly. It left Glasgow for Montreal, basically. It had a thousand, just over a thousand passengers, had some Jewish refugees on it had about 500 Canadians it had about 300 American citizens it had 72 British subjects and they had about 300 crew so all in what's that, a lot about, of people yeah it's about a thousand a thousand one hundred people basically hmm. but civilians on a passenger liner so when they set out the world was not at war oh a few hours into their journey <laughs> the world was at war <laughs> oh wow okay so this was uh, arguably a poorly timed journey for them oh So war was declared when they were just literally hours out of port. Uh, And out in the Atlantic, U-boats were stalking, looking for targets, including U-30. This was a submarine commanded by Oberlieutenant Fritz Julius Lemp. Okay. He was 26 years old. One of the youngest officers to command a U-boat. Wow, that's amazing. 26 years old. responsibility. Yeah, really. So about 200 nautical miles, that's 370 kilometers off the coast of Ireland, U-30 spots a ship. Captain has a look and he says, oh, that ship looks like it's darkened and it's kind of off the shipping routes and it's steering in kind of a zigzaggy course. And all of these are traits that made him think this might be a troop ship or a Q ship or an armed ship of some kind. In other words, a legitimate target. But it wasn't. It was the Athenia. It was just a passenger ship with a cargo of perfectly unsuspecting passengers. And they were enjoying their journey. And for three whole hours, they enjoyed their journey whilst being tracked invisibly by U-30. Oh, that's creepy, isn't it? Finally, still thinking he's looking at a legitimate target, Lemp issued the order to fire. Really? Deadly torpedoes slipped through the Atlantic water. One of them exploded on Athenia's port side in her engine room with devastating effect. Obviously, something's exploded. You've got a problem. Realising they're in danger, the Athenia sends out a distress signal begging for help from anyone in the area because they knew they were going to sink. They've been hit by a torpedo and they're in trouble. Fortunately, they weren't too far out in the Atlantic and they weren't alone. Several ships responded to their cry for help. HMS Electra was a British warship, came along and organised the other ships. HMS Fame, a Royal Navy vessel, was ordered to go drive around looking for the U-boat to make Mm. sure it wasn't still around. Another ship, Royal Navy, the HMS Escort started to pick up survivors, as did the Southern Cross, a Swedish luxury yacht that was actually once owned by Howard Hughes, oh, right. uh, and a US cargo ship called the City of Flint. So all of these ships came to help the people who were in this sinking ship. So this is really a lesson of equality in the face of disaster at sea that is the kind of thing you would hope people would do, and it's an inspiration. Yeah, for sure. So the ship took 14 hours to sink. That was enough time to save a lot of people, but not everyone. 19 crew members were killed, and 98 passengers were killed, a lot of them by the the explosion of the torpedo. I was going to say, yeah, just from the explosion in the engine room, right? Let's kill a few of them off. Exactly. And that included a 10-year-old Canadian girl called Margaret Hayworth, who was one of the first Canadians to be killed by enemy action. Wow, within hours of the war starting. Hours, literally hours. So obviously the sinking of a passenger ship was big news, hence the red letters on the newspaper headline. Mm. Questions were asked, how could civilians be targeted? So the German Ministry of Propaganda asked the Navy, and the Navy said there were no U-boats in that area. It wasn't us, Governor. 
So the propaganda ministry says, no, it wasn't us. And they instead said that the British had torpedoed their own vessel in an effort to bring the United States into the war. Ooh, conspiracy stuff. Of course, this wasn't true. They they thought there'd be nobody, nobody in the area, partly because not all the U-boats had come back and you don't go running around doing lots of radio messages when you're a U-boat at sea. So they'd been running silently and they eventually get back to dock on 27th of September, 1939. So U-30 was met by the man in charge of U-boats, Admiral Donitz. Captain Krispy Kreme. <laughs> <laughs> he met Captain Lemp when he was disembarking from the U-boat and Donitz later said Lemp looked very unhappy. Well, you can imagine as well he might. He confesses his mistake. He says, I, I did it. I sank the Athenia. So what do they do now? So word goes up to Hitler. Sorry, who? Hitler. No, I'm not. I'm oh, he's, uh, he was the chap in charge of the German side of the war. Little moustache, Charlie Chaplin-y looking fella. Uh, never heard that name. So Hitler and the government decide, let's cover it up. <laughs> Right. <laughs> of course. So the high command of the Navy said, right, well, we're not going to court Marshal Lemp because he was acting in good faith. Also, that would then be a public record of him having sunk it. The authorities denied all the allegations. They altered the U-30 ship's log, tore a page out and sellotaped another one in going, no I definitely didn't sink the Athenia today. <laughs> and meanwhile, in fake news, the Volkischer Beobachter, the Nazis' official paper, continued to blame the loss of the Athenia on the UK. I don't understand. Why, why was this? Why didn't they just take credit for it and go, yeah, this is war? Because... The war started it wasn't like it hadn't started well one of the big fears for germany was america joining the war and they've killed a bunch of americans who uh. were just traveling on a passenger liner two it's just bad form isn't it there, there were rules there are rules of war you don't just kill anyone you come across there's supposed to be a certain amount of humanity involved even though it's an inhumane business by and large uh, but actually it wasn't until the nuremberg trials in 1946 after the war ended that the germans finally admitted the truth about the athenia and that they had sunk it so this was a tragedy it was literally a red letter day and and it was one of the first casualties in the first hours of the Battle of the Atlantic and World War II. So... Between September and December 1939, U-boats sank 110 merchant vessels. Britain started to feel the consequences of it. This was a real problem. If only the Allies had some way of knowing where the U-boats were. This brings me to the next story, which I call The Big Red Book. Now, on the 5th of June 2014, Bonham's Auction House had a lot item for sale, not a lot of stuff. <laughs> this lot was a book with a red cloth cover. Uh, it was written in German. The pages and the ink on them is designed to dissolve in water. Huh? And this was because it was supposed to be a book that was easy to destroy, because this in particular was a 1944 edition of the Kurt Signal Heft. But you might recognise it by the name Enigma Codebook. Ooh, yeah, we know the Enigma. We've, We've seen the indeed. machine, haven't we? <laughs> Episode 50. HHE podcast. Check it out. So in May 1941, we're going back a bit now, the British destroyer HMS Bulldog was escorting a convoy from Britain to America. They were now about 300 miles off Ireland's coast. That seemed to be a dangerous area because that's not far off where Athena was. But the captain was looking out and he suddenly sees two huge plumes of water next to two of his ships that he's escorting. Whales. Not whales, unfortunately. Torpedoes hitting the ships he's supposed to be escorting. Oh my gosh. So clearly a U-boat had stuck. Unmistakable sight. The two boats start to sink. And meanwhile, on the U-boat, this is U-110, the captain gave the order for a third torpedo to fire. Wait, I'm a bit confused. How come they're now firing on these stuff and not popping up and saying, Guten Tag, give us all your stuff? I think the, they're our military target because there's a convoy that's escorted by warships. Okay, so that makes sense. you can't rise up because you're going to get shot immediately. So I think that makes it legitimate. I'm not sure what the fine print of the law says, but yeah. that's my interpretation of it. Pop into the surface and going, good and dark, <laughs> in the face of a half a dozen corvettes. Doesn't seem like a good idea, does it? So... The captain of the U-110, his name was Fritz Julius Lemp. Fritz Julian Lemp. Fritz Julius Lemp. You may remember him as the captain that sank the Athenia. Oh, he's back. He's the same guy. Oh, okay. He's still out there plying his deadly trade. How old is he now? Uh, he's 28 now. Uh, now, unfortunately for Lemp, he ordered the third torpedo to fire and it started to fire, but it stuck in the tube. And that caused a mechanical issue, which meant they couldn't dive. Now, oh. what you would normally do is fire your torpedoes and then dive down and hide, essentially. He couldn't dive. Because it would explode or something? No, what happened was the, the torpedo lodged in the tube and the way the, the firing mechanism would work was because the torpedo is quite heavy, the, the U-boat would take in water to balance the loss of the weight of the torpedo. So it took in the water 
but the torpedo was still there. So they had oh. double the weight, so the nose tilted, so it couldn't dive. That's what was stopping it diving. Good answer. Thank you. No problem. I'm quite pleased that I was able to answer that. <laughs> um, so then when the convoy escort comes around hunting for them, so they, they weren't on the surface at this point. They're, they're a little bit underwater, I think. So the, the escort comes on, starts throwing out depth charges that are going right. off all around. They All they can do is wait. They can't dive to safety. They just have to wait to see what happens. Lemp tries to settle his men down. He says, it's okay. We're all going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's a they bold weren't. move. <laughs> I mean, you've got to say something, I suppose. But yeah. uh, yes, that was uh, optimistic at the very best. Uh, the U-boat then became so damaged the depth meters were broken. So now they didn't know what was happening. They didn't, are we sinking? Are we rising up? They had oh, no idea what depth they were at. Okay, this is triggering lots of lots of different phobias in me. Can you even imagine the anxiety? So they're <sighs> just sitting there, just going boom, boom. There's depth charts going on all around. And they're going, are we just sinking to be crushed by the depths of the sea? Are we rising? up where there's a bunch of warships waiting for us in any event there's not a lot of good outcomes waiting for you here so they wait and they wait and eventually they feel the boat rocking and the rocking is, is reason it's rocking is because waves causing the ship to rock which means they've reached the surface basically okay right. so that's kind of the better of the two options they had in front of them so lemp shouts out out the destroyer is going to ram us because now there's two warships bearing down oh. on the submarine <laughs> So the crew just abandon ship as quickly as they can. They all pile out up the conning tower and get the heck off that ship as mm. fast as they possibly can. So now you've got a submarine which everyone's abandoned ship. It's potentially sinking. Any sane person would get as far away as possible, especially because a crew generally wouldn't just leave a submarine. They would tend to scuttle it. The British, on the other side, decided to board it. So a boarding party led by Sub-Lieutenant David Balm went over to the sub on a little boat and Balm himself climbed the ladder into the vessel. So he didn't know what was down there he didn't know if there was a soldier with a gun waiting for him he didn't know if they'd rigged it with explosives all he knew is he had to go down and have a look at what was in this ship <laughs> and he had to use both hands to climb down the ladder so he was basically defenseless yeah. as he climbs this ladder i'm picturing him with a dagger between his teeth though uh, that would help wouldn't it um, yeah let's say he had one of those <laughs> and an eye patch <laughs> and a wooden you, leg you've made him into a pirate haven't yeah you? <laughs> i have yeah well Baum later recalled he said going down those ladders and thinking there may be germans ready to shoot it was terrifying we couldn't believe that they would just abandon this submarine it was something that haunted me for 15 or 20 years afterwards. So anyway, he gets to the bottom, he finds it safe, he tells the guys to follow, they form a human chain and pass code books and charts and mm. everything up the conning tower. Then they come across an interesting thing. Uh, it's kind of like a typewriter. You press a key and a little letter, a different letter weirdly, on a light board uh, lights up. So he didn't know what it was, but he thought, that's interesting. He unscrew it from the desk and go, we'll take that with us as well. And then, so they scavenged this boat for an hour and a half. Mm. During that time, I guess it got less scary because the captain of the bulldog sent some sandwiches over yeah. while, they, while they were searching That's this very thing. nice and eventually they go back to the bulldog <laughs> with their prize of uh, maps and code books and this machine yeah and full tummies well yes exactly and a delicious ham sandwich uh, the next morning u110 had indeed slipped beneath the waves and sunk never to be seen again as had presumably captain lent who was also never seen again oh really captain lent is presumed dead lost at sea as a result of this incident so a couple of days later the bulldog arrives in scarpa flow in the orkneys northern scotland to meet an intelligence officer to say oh we've got a big bag of interesting stuff here they rush it to bletchley park the code breaking facility we've been there and we have indeed been there episode, episode 50, 50. <laughs> <H-H-E podcast. laughs> yeah. and plot twist the enigma machine didn't really matter. Actually, the British already had some of these, oh. so it didn't really help at all. <laughs> Add it to the collection, boys. <laughs> Chuck it on the pile of Cheers. Enigma But what was really important, they found, was papers that were the settings and the procedure used for what were called officier messages, the special, extra important, doubly enciphered messages. They had the instructions for how to set up the machine. Okay. And that super helped them break the most important messages for the intelligence services to figure out how to decrypt Germany's messages. That's fantastic. Good news. This find was so important. King George VI said the operation was perhaps the most important single event in the whole war at sea. Wow. Side note, if you want a cinematic version of this sort of story, there's a film called U571. Uh huh. This depicts a fictional event where an Enigma machine is recovered from a German U-boat. Tiny changes, the U-boat has a different number and the people who recover the materials are all American. <laughs> 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 yeah okay that said sub lieutenant Le- sub lieutenant blaine the man who first boarded that original ship he himself said it's a great film so who are we to judge holy moly we've done it again we've captured the enigma machine for america um hello hello there we've changed the course of the war uh, can you hear me though it's- 
Is this thing on? All alone, with no help from anybody, with good old American ingenuity. Well, I say, we are here too, you know. Go America! Uh, and Britain! Don't forget Britain! We'll make a movie of our heroics, so this is remembered in perpetuity as yet another American victory. Well, that's just the tiniest smidge upsetting. I want a ham sandwich. <laughs> if you can decode this message, I'll make you one. <laughs> okay, our next story is called The Red Cross and Blood in the Water. So the sinking of U-110 was just one victory. It was very important, but it was just one victory in the Battle of the Atlantic, as we know, drags on and on. U-boats, a little bit less effective now the codes have been broken, but, you know, it was a bit of an ongoing cat and mouse game, the code breaking. Still a terrifying threat in the ocean. Mm. Now we're moving into 12th of September 1942. A U-boat called U-156 was on patrol off the coast of Western Africa. Okay. Its captain was a guy called Werner Hartenstein. He spotted a ship, and this was the RMS Laconia. It's a British ship. Uh, yes, I think so. The ship was armed, so that makes it a legitimate attack target for uh, the rules of prize. Yeah. So the U-156 did what the, they would do under those circumstances. Again, a torpedo hisses through the water. Now, what Captain Hartenstein did not know and couldn't have known was all the ship was carrying was people. It had 463 crew. There were 87 civilians aboard. There were 286 British soldiers on board. There were 1,700 Italian prisoners of war and 103 Polish soldiers who were acting as guards for the prisoners. Wow, that's a lot of people. A lot of people. The torpedo hits the boat. Immediately begins to list to one side. And because it's listing to one side, all of the lifeboats on that side couldn't be launched. Oh, of course, yeah, because it's it's leaning over and the uh, lifeboats go down and over the side, right? So they can't get the boats off. Oof. People start throwing themselves off the ship into the water however they can. The prisoners had been left locked up in the boat. They broke out, as you might imagine. They were ugly, ugly scenes. Italian prisoners attempted to board lifeboats and they were shot or bayoneted. Some of them had their hands chopped off with axes to stop them boarding the <sighs> lifeboats. Oh, my God. The red blood of the wounded flowed into the water. And in that water, the sharks began to circle and a feeding frenzy began. As the Laconia sank, U-156 surfaced with the intention of capturing some senior officers because they still didn't know what had been yeah. in that ship. And only now, Captain Hartenstein looks out and he sees the water littered with thousands of desperate people dying, sharks, blood in the water. And he thinks, oh, what have I done here? So he raises a flag the Red Cross, to indicate that he's now on a rescue mission. Okay. So more than that, he gets big red crosses painted on bed sheets, throws them over the ship's guns to make it clear what their intentions are. He also radios his base. He radios Admiral Donitz, who gets the message. He immediately orders seven new boats from nearby to divert to the scene to pick up survivors. Wow, okay. Hartens I thought he would have just sailed off. Well, the mission did, accomplished. As I said at the beginning, sometimes the enemy is not always bad with the bad guy. Hartenstein also issues an open, unencoded message in English saying, help, if any ship, he says, will assist the shipwrecked Laconia crew, I will not attack her, provided I'm not being attacked by ship or air force. Fair. So for two and a half days, U-156 remains on the surface at the scene. She's joined by three more submarines, and the four submarines then start towing some lifeboats and have survivors standing on their decks, start heading for the African coastline to meet some French ships that had also been sent out to help. And on the 16th of September, U-156 was spotted by an American B-24 bomber that was flying from a secret airbase on Ascension Island. Hartenstein signaled to the pilot in Morse code and one of the British survivors even messaged the plane. RAF officer speaking from German submarine, Laconia survivors on board, soldiers, civilians, women, children. Pilot notified the base about what he's seen. The senior officer on the base, Captain Robert C. Richardson III, gives his order to the B-24 bomber, sink the sub. Why would he do that? Well, he claims he believed by the rules of war a combat ship couldn't fly Red Cross flags. He thought it might be a trick that the submarine would attack any ships sent to help. He assumed that they were only picking up Italian prisoners of war and not helping anybody else. And he also was scared that this secret airfield would be discovered uh, by the submarine. Oof, this is his allies. Yes, they are. <laughs> Amongst others, certainly. So the bomber flew back and dropped bombs and depth charges on the U-boats and the survivors that it was trying to help. One bomb managed to land amongst the lifeboats. Others caused a bit of damage to the U-boat, so Hartenstein had to do something. He cast the lifeboats adrift and said, well, sorry, guys, I'm going to have to dive. And he dived and told the people on the deck, because don't forget, there's people also on the deck of the submarine. He's like, guys, I've got to go. <sighs> he starts to submerge. He does it as slowly as he can to at least give those people on deck a chance to escape. So the plane made four runs in total at the submarine. 
But uh, all it managed to do really was sink two lifeboats and a bit of minor damage to U-156. The crew of the plane were later awarded medals for supposedly sinking the U-156. They did not sink the U-156. But they got medals though, so... So, yes. So two other U-boats were told, there's a problem here, we're being attacked, and they were ordered to cast adrift any survivors. They chose not to do that. Really? So eventually the French ships arrived to pick up the remaining survivors. 373 Italians, 70 Poles, and 597 British, including 48 women and children, were saved. Hundreds more were left dead in the water. So it was after this event that Admiral Donitz issued what was known as the Triton Null Order, later known as the Laconia Order, which prohibited U-boat crews from attempting to rescue people in a situation like this. Oh, so if it happened again, they wouldn't be allowed. Exactly. And apparently some of them just ignored that order. Yeah. But this is just a saddening demonstration of when one person forgets their humanity, it can cause a ripple effect that just makes life a lot worse for all of us. So that is a Red Cross and blood in the water. sailing home again across the sea we are sailing stormy waters to be near you to be free captain captain torpedoes incoming starboard side Emergency stations! Red alert! We've been hit! It looks bad! Damage report! The hull is breached, Captain! Send out an emergency distress signal! There's water rushing in! The pumps can't cope with it! I'm really wet! Send up some flares! Oh my god! Abandoned ship! Distribute the life to the lifeboats! Abandoned ship! Abandoned ship! Well... It's been an honour serving with you, my captain. The honour is all mine, my friend. Shall we open that last bottle of rum? Aye, aye, captain. To the queen. To the queen. Our next story, Ryan, is called A Red Brick Refuge. Okay. If you travel to the small Newfoundland town of St. John's, Canada, head towards the docks, you might find yourself in front of an unassuming red brick building. You go down a little alley and up a steep, steep staircase, you'll find yourself in a very special little bar. This place is known as the Crow's Nest, and it's been there since it was first established in 1942 as a club for officers from the merchant ships and the escorts that were braving the Atlantic crossing. Well, the guys we were talking about earlier. Exactly the guys. Wow, okay. So I bet they had some stories in there. I bet they did. And in fact, I managed to catch up with the club treasurer, a person called Margaret Morris, lovely lady, very helpful, and she told me a little bit about this incredible place. Well, it's still going. It's still going. It's still a club. wow. And yeah, she introduced me to it. So why don't we listen to what she had to say? The Crow's Nest started in 1942. Initially, it was called the Seagoing Officers Club, and it was an exclusive club strictly for the seagoing officers fighting in the Battle of the Atlantic. It was a safe haven for them, a place uh, where they could rest, relax, get to know each other. Uh, Captain Mingi, who had the vision for the crow's nest, understood the importance of personal relationships. And he said, if if the convoy system is going to be efficient, effective, successful, the officers have to get to know each other. They have to have trust and confidence in each other. And it makes a difference. If you know the officer on the bridge of another ship, can you count on him to give you a straight answer? Yeah, most importantly, will he keep a cool head when things go off the rails? So that was one factor. And the other factor was post-traumatic stress. And Mingi, I think, was ahead of his time here. Uh, even before the term, I don't, I don't know if the term was even coined back then uh, or the condition officially recognized, but he understood the importance of having a safe, secure environment where these guys could talk it out. And, and they had some tough calls ahead of them. You know, if, if you're escorting ships in convoy and one gets torpedoed and sinks, do you stop for survivors? Do you go after the attacking U-boat or do you stay with the convoy? No matter which way you cut that, you're going to have doubt, second thought, regret, guilt, all of the above. So uh, these these are tough calls. I personally cannot imagine leaving people in the water. 
but but sometimes they, they had to do that. So this was a place where they could talk it out amongst themselves, you know, with their peers, without judgment, because they'd all been in the same situation. They didn't have to put on a brave face for outsiders who didn't know the environment they were working in. So uh, yeah, a place of uh, rest and relaxation for them, a place to, to develop camaraderie, get to know each other, that sort of thing. And it was in the crow's nest that the Barber Pole Brigade got started. Wow. What an eloquent lady. She's marvellously articulate. I was so, so lucky to come across her. Now, Captain Mingi, uh, which, side note, is, uh, is spelt main guy. <laughs> rented Captain this... main guy. I know. <laughs> you couldn't make it up, could you? So he rented I'm this... Corporal Top Dude. <laughs> I know. It's a name to conjure with. So he finds this bit of attic space in a warehouse and the owner rents it to him for a dollar a year and a peppercorn, apparently. Um, but you'll notice at the end there, Margaret mentioned the Barber Pole Brigade, which is another red connection for our story. Have listened to what she has to say about the barber pole people. During World War II, in the crow's nest, uh, two executive officers from uh, escort ships were discussing, they they thought all the ships looked alike. So they thought it would be nice to have some sort of distinguishing feature on on the escort ships. So they thought a red and white band around the funnel. Uh, They weren't supposed to use radios because that could give away your position. So they thought, you know, when they scan the horizon and have some distinguishing feature on the uh, the escorts, the other ships of their escort group, it'd be... uh, It'd be nice. So they thought a red and white stripe around the funnel, but they didn't paint them up in St. John's because the weather is often cool and damp. So they waited until they got to Londonderry and they started painting up their funnels. And one of the ship's officers had to go ashore for some reason. He comes back. He's challenged at the gate. And the guard at the gate says, oh, you're part of that barber pole brigade. And they hadn't thought of it as a barber pole stripe. They just thought of it as red and white band around the funnel. I think they chose red and white for the same reason that lighthouses are often red and white and aids to navigation are often red and white. These colors stand out well in a marine environment. The the term struck. It was well received. They began to refer to themselves as the barber pole brigade. So that the Barber of Cold Brigade began life in this bar, in this crow's nest place. And they were all identifiable by the red and white stripe on their funnels. And to this day, the Canadian Navy that are working in the Atlantic have that same marking. It's funny, when she mentioned funnel for the first time, I was thinking, what funnel? Like, what, what does that mean? I was trying to think of what that could possibly mean. But I'm thinking with a modern brain, aren't I? These are, <laughs> these are steam or uh, like... Certainly- Coal powered, coal some powered of them, chips, yeah. yeah. So that's like where all the smoke comes you need out. An exhaust, don't you? In the any chimneys, of yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this whole thing began life in this one small warehouse rooftop bar in in Newfoundland. And I asked Margaret because this is an audio podcast, as I'm sure you're aware. It's a visual treat. This bar. So I asked her just describe to walk us through the bar. To enter the club, you go through a very short alleyway, up an exterior set of stairs, in through a door that used to be a window, and uh, then another set of stairs, and that will take you to what what is today known as the Crow's Nest. Like, say, back in World War II, it was the Seagoing Officers Club. And as you enter the room, it's a rough room. It's not posh at all, but it's a very colorful room. A lot of people uh, refer to it as a visual feast. Mingi was ahead of his time, again, in, in understanding people. In the early days of the club, the walls were bare, so the fellows started, the room was rough, so the fellows started scratching the name of their ship into the deckhead and bulkhead, to use nautical terms. And Mingi didn't want graffiti in the crow's nest. As rough as the room was, he wanted to try and he wanted to try and maintain some sort of decorum appropriate to a proper officer's club. And that, of course, didn't include graffiti. But, you know, he understood human nature and, and he realized you may as well accept human nature as try and change it. People want to leave their mark. So that's when he decided, okay, no more graffiti. Instead, each ship is allocated a portion of wall space to leave their mark. So this led to the creation of what, what we call gun shield art. It's very similar to the Air Force having nose art on, on their on their airplanes. And uh, each, each of these uh, pieces is a play on the name of the captain or the name of the ship or some episode in the ship's service history. So there's all kinds of terrific stories behind behind these gun shields. I can only imagine some of the stories. That's amazing. And it's great because they're really idiosyncratic. Some of them are really artistic. Some of them are really crude, but funny, cartoonish. Mm. There's all these just little two two by two panels of expression, I guess, each from its own boat. And I had a favorite. It was from a ship which was known as a corvette. I mentioned that the corvettes were a type of ship. And this one was called Wetaskawin. 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 And their ship art, uh, well, I asked uh, Margaret to tell us more about it. Well, uh, it was uh, Churchill who chose the Corvette as an escort ship. Churchill 
decided to name them all after flowers. Uh, in Canada, we, we followed the same example, building corvettes, naming them after flowers. But then it was our Admiral Nellies, Canadian uh, Admiral Nellies, who said, flowers don't knit mittens. He said, from here on, our ships are going to be named after small communities that represent where the crew crews come from and where the ships are being built. So Wetaskiwin was uh, one of the Corvettes named after a small community out in Alberta. It's a First Nations name. Uh, a lot of people have trouble pronouncing it. So it got known as the Wet Ass Queen. So and and the if you have a look at the gun shield art for it, it, it reflects a, a princess or a queen sitting on a lump of ice that in a puddle of water that kind of resembles a map in Newfoundland and a clear play on the name of the ship. The wet ass queen. But uh, that was definitely my favourite. But all of them are fascinating. I really <laughs> yeah. recommend you go online and have a look at the the images of the place. Uh, but interestingly, they also apparently still, if a new warship, it's not a navy town today, but they still sometimes get new gun shield art mm -hmm. from visitors if they are naval visitors. They still allow that. Why? Why wouldn't you do that? Though you get more, you keep adding it to the collection. It's it's a real living history. I mean, I, it's a term that's used a lot, but this place is living history. But the gun shields aren't the only striking decoration. The place is packed with these fascinating weird odds and ends. A lot of them really with an incredible history. But I do have a favourite. So I asked about one of the bar's more striking decorations, the crow's nest periscope. Wow. Okay. I like this already. I love a periscope. At the end of the war, the U-190 uh, surrendered off the south coast of Newfoundland. So they were ordered to uh, to surface, dump ammo, and uh, proceed to Bay Bulls. That's a small community about an hour south of St. John's. And in Bay Bulls, they were met by two Canadian ships. The, the German crew was taken off, and an Allied crew put aboard. And the Allied crew brought the U-190 into St. John's for a few days, and then on to Halifax. It was commissioned in the Canadian Navy as HMCS, Her Majesty's Canadian, or His Majesty's Canadian Submarine uh, U-190. And the Canadian uh, Navy used it for two years, took it up the St. Lawrence Seaway, up to the Great Lakes, showed Canadians what a German U-boat was all about. And then, of course, after the war, everyone's rebuilding, resources are scarce. So um, in 1947, on Trafalgar Day, actually, they uh, decided they had no more use for it, and they used it for target practice. And uh, they uh, they took some obviously some souvenirs off it. The biggest being the, the periscopes and the ship's clock. We we also have the or subs clock, I should say. Uh, we also have that in uh, in the club. Anyway, the periscope laid around in dockyard and naval dockyard in Halifax for some years, and it was in the early '60s. Apparently, a couple of naval officers at the at the club got into a little. Uh, bet, you know, saying, I bet you can't get that periscope, bet you I can, bet you can't. And um, next thing you know, a periscope uh, shows up in town. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like something to drunk sailors might do exactly right and you can now see the periscope on that i had a little walk a google maps walk through yeah. <laughs> through the town and uh, yeah you can see the periscope poking up through the roof uh, unfortunately it doesn't work anymore due to no. damage but uh, I, I had a vision of canadians watching out for threats yeah. over the atlantic but no it doesn't function anymore but uh, it is still a remarkable thing but this is still a members club to this day it is a functioning bar it's a club it has members so i asked margaret well who who comes to the bar today we generally don't get any riffraff in the crow's nest. You know, anyone who finds their way there normally has an interest in the history, uh, the stories on the wall. They have some connection to the, to the past, you know. And lots of people come in really shyly asking uh, if we have this crest or that crest badge, gun shield art for this one or another ships. And, and they get very emotional when they... Uh, when they see, when they have some tangible connection to the past. And we, we had one fellow, he came in there, um, his father had been in the crow's nest when victory in Europe was declared. So he got emotional. You know? and, but it, that's good, you know, it, 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 it means a lot to people. So no riffraff, eh? No riffraff. They've got no signage. There is nothing to indicate this place is there unless you happen to look up and go, that's a periscope. There's probably a naval club there. I'm, I'm disappointed there's no riffraff because that means we can't join. Well, you say that, Ryan, but I am pleased to tell you that actually History Happened Everywhere have officially applied for lifetime membership of the Crow's Nest Club. <laughs> so next time we're in St. John's, Newfoundland, provided uh, my check clears, yeah. <laughs> we will be able to pop in for a drink. Uh, I want this to happen. Make, I this, make this happen. I do too. I'm just going to need to figure out how to get the international payment and we're there. I've got okay. the forms all filled out. Uh, but for now, how about we have a tot and toast to the crow's nest. Can we go by U-boat? <laughs> you know what they do to U-boats around there. Oh, yeah. To the crow's nest. The crow's nest. That was fantastic. What was that lady's name? That was Margaret Morris, who was extraordinarily helpful and extremely articulate, I thought. Absolutely. Margaret Morris, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. 
So to wrap up, the war drags on until the 30th of June 1945. Hitler commits suicide. The following day, Goebbels commits suicide. So that left who in charge? None other than Admiral Dönitz. What? He became, Donuts is in charge. Then became in charge of what were admittedly the smoking embers of the Third Reich. But he was the person who, in the end, officially surrendered to the Allies. I crawl here on my knees all the way from my house to ask for your forgiveness. Are you kidding me? I did not know this. There you go. So Admiral Donitz actually brought the war to an end. He was enough. the Führer? Does that count? I, I'm not sure if he had the title Führer, but he was certainly in charge. The guy in charge. Uh, not for long, clearly. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, sure, but still. But at what cost, ultimately? In the Battle of the Atlantic, three and a half thousand merchant ships were sunk. 175 Allied warships were sunk. 783 U-boats and 47 German surface warships were all lost. So there is one final red, Ryan, that I want to think about, and that is the red of the poppy that we wear today to remember the people who are lost at war. So I do propose we have a final toast, Ryan, to the men and women who were lost, lest we forget. Lest we forget. And there you have it. Red in the Atlantic during World War Two. Marvellous. What a fantastic journey you've taken us on. I'm, I, I feel a little bit on edge. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, everything about that was terrifying. You, you <laughs> triggered a lot of my phobias, as I said. <laughs> Being claustrophobic inside, under deep underwater. Every moment, like you're on a boat, there's a secret thing following you that you don't know about. You're, in, you're underwater. Ah, everything just seemed not conducive to relaxation. Let's put it that way. Well, look, I mean, I think you did a fantastic job at describing red in the Atlantic during World War II. I think at the time we anticipated that it might be a little dark. <laughs> yes, I think episode. we knew it was going to be a little bit bleak, didn't we? It did, but you brought some levity to it as well and some fascinating facts about rum. Always a pleasure. I will try and make all of my episodes rum-based so in will, the future. I will salute that again. <laughs> Here's to you. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> So, Peter, it's that time again. Is it already? It is, and the periscope has risen, and it's pointing towards me. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered where you were going with that. The Nazis want to know what the next episode is? I'm sure everyone does, regardless uh, sure of their uh, political beliefs. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's time for us to roll out the Dursalator. No, 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 no. What, what, what do you mean? Well, it's this time of year, Ryan. It's time for a spooky episode. So you have to go into the dank, dark, cobwebby cellar and pull out the Spookalator. It's Halloween special. Okay, here we go. Oh, it's creepy. Look at it. I wasn't sure if it was a ghost or if it just had a sheet over it to protect it from dust. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very bulky ghost. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ryan, are you ready? I am more than ready. I am terrifiedly ready. <laughs> All right. Your place is... Okay. United Arab Emirates. <laughs> <Woo -hoo>. <laughs> <laughs> UAE. Okay, UAE. I'm not familiar with what's terrifying about UAE, but I'm sure you'll find something. Okay. Okay, your time is... Mm -hmm. The frightening era of 1750 to 1850 CE. Ah! One of the scariest times ever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is going to be such fun. All right. And are you ready for your terrible topic? Here we go. The Boogeyman. <laughs> the Boogeyman. Boogeyman. Ah! <laughs> now, I would have called him the Bogeyman, so I'm already scared. <laughs> All right, so I am doing the Boogeyman in the United Arab Emirates during 1750 to 1850 for our spooky Halloween special. A festival of fright. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, look, 
That is all that the time that we have for this episode. Thank you all for listening. If you'd like to get in touch about any of the things that Pete's been talking about, or just to say hello, uh, you can reach out to us through our website at hhepodcast.com or by email at Pete and Ryan at hhepodcast.com. As ever, we'd love to hear from you, and you never know, you might end up featured on a future show. That's right. And if you're on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, you can find us at HHE Podcast. Subscribe to those things and you will get an alert when we post one of our one minute animated HHE Bites. That's right. And on our website, we have our merchandise there with our newly minted Lord of the Rings t-shirts. But we're going to be back again soon with The Verdict. But until then, a huge underwater thank you to Mr. Peter Goddard. A depth charge of a thank you to you, Ryan. (laughs) And that's it. I guess all that's left to say is you've been listening to... happened everywhere. Oh, oh, oh my God! Hey, Ryan! Hey, Captain Pete! What is this? Did, did you do this? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I did that. Th- that's disgusting. What, whatever possessed you? Well, you told me this is the poop deck. Oh, that is vile. That is not what the poop deck is for. You are disgusting. Oh, uh, well... You're going to really hate what I've done in the seamen's quarters. Oh, my God. Blammo!